Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. One of the unique opportunities I've had over the past few months is to take a look at and evaluate a project in Guatemala. This is in a city uh, in the area near Guatemala. The name of the city was Chiquimula. And uh, I'm going to take you with me on this trip using different pictures that I've taken on this trip uh, itself. Now, Chiquimula is an area that's very uh, unique to Guatemala. It's one of the few areas that does not have a lot of rain for it. And because of this, the project site that we are going to take a look at is uh, I mean, inhabited mostly by indigenous people. And because of the fact that they are indigenous people and the fact that there's not much water there, um, we, we will find that the living conditions have been very, very well compromised. And because of that, Rotary International and a district and club in the area of Canada has gone in to actually try and make a difference there. This grant is a $200,000 grant that actually will teach people how to farm on small um, areas, small, about 100 square foot gardens in each of these uh, households. And with that, they'll be able to not only fend for themselves, grow their own food, but also have some crops actually available to sell. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. The first picture that I have shows a picture of myself along with Jose Moreno and his wife, Linda. They greeted me at the uh, airport. And one thing uh, that I don't expect, and it probably will never happen again, was that um, Jose said that he would meet me at the airport and take care of me once I landed in Guatemala City. Well, when I landed on the airplane, I uh, walked off, got through into the airport itself, just getting off the airplane, um, Jose greeted me along with his wife and six other black-suited gentlemen, uh, Secret Service men, that then escorted me out of the uh, airport into a an area, a sitting area, where it was very nice, very comfortable lounge, all leather, uh, had bar and everything else you could think of there. And he asked me, he says, give me your passport, give me your immigration papers, and give me your baggage claim ticket because I will have my guys take care of that for you. So as we sat down, had a drink, um, Diet Coke, of course, um, they sent the group out and the group actually came back later on to confirm and verify that this was my passport, this in fact had been taken care of, and this was my luggage. Now, I had never <laughs> experienced that, nor will I ever plan to experience this again. Jose Moreno, my classmate from the year 2011-12, was a governor from Guatemala, and he has now moved up into the president's ca uh, cabinet. He is the Minister of Social Development for all of Guatemala, one of the top eight people, I believe, in that cabinet. So he has uh, ex ex expert clearance with the president of Guatemala. So that was uh, my story on entering into Guatemala. And again, I don't ever expect to have VIP treatment like that for the rest of my life, but it was good to have it at least once. The next picture is a picture of the city of uh, Jocotan, Guatemala. And this is the area that we actually did the projects itself in. And as you can see from the picture, it's a very industrious city, a uh, small city, but they have quite a few things going on in the city itself. The area that the project is going to be done in is an outlying area. It's up in the mountains that you can see behind this picture. The project vehicle that you're seeing now is uh, the project vehicle that was actually purchased by this grant. And the reason that this vehicle is purchased, it usually does not happen by the Rody Foundation where they purchase vehicles. But in this case, it was such a remote area that they needed to have staff able to get to these areas on, on regular uh, regular notice, so it's at least once or twice a week that they will go into these indigenous villages and take a look at what's going on. Picture that you see here is a picture of the road that I had to take, and you can see why now uh, you need the vehicle. It's extremely mountainous in the region areas that I went to. Uh, most of the area has now been deforested. If there's forest at all, they're pretty much gone, and it's a very desolate area. The next picture uh, is kind of the countryside of the picture um, that we see there. It's, again, the most arid area of all of Guatemala. The project itself included 66 families, about 400 people. Um, the descent is Mayan Chorti, uh, so most of the people there are Mayan of descent. And 50% of the children there were suffering from malnutrition. 18% of those people there also living in extreme poverty and 73% of the people that were from this village were moderately or severely below um, the average height and that is because of the malnutrition that they were experiencing over generations in this specific area. 
Now, if we didn't have our private car, this is how we would have ended up getting up that mountain. And you can see this picture. There's probably about 20 people in the back of this Toyota pickup truck. And they have little rails on the side, and it fits everybody and anybody you could think of. They, this is the way they get to and from the city of uh, Hokotan. The next picture shows a, a picture of kind of the average living conditions. This is a home that's along the road, the main road going up into the mountains. And as you can see, the um, construction of it is all done by palm fronds. Now, they're beautifully done. Uh, very nice houses. And as you know, there's no windows, no doors, no anything on any of these buildings because the weather is uh, so mild. Uh, when I say mild, it's hot. You wouldn't have to worry about being cold at night. But at the same time, there's not a lot of need or necessity for windows or doors. The next picture shows the uh, construction as we get closer to the home itself. And this is one of the houses where we did one of the projects. The next picture shows the construction. And by the way, uh, they do a beautiful job of putting these together. As you can see by the uh, detailing on the palm fronds and the way they're tied together, it creates a pretty sound wall. They do a good job of that, keeping uh, everything in place, making sure that um, it's well insulated because these houses, believe it or not, are pretty cool on the inside considering how hot it was on the outside. When I say hot, every day that I was there, it was a five-day trip. I was on the project site for three of those five days. The other two days were travel time. Um, the temperature was 100 degrees or warmer. And so when you go inside these shaded areas, it definitely is a, a little relief from the sun that you're receiving every day. The next picture is the community of uh, Hoken. And in Hoken, um, this again was a village that was inhabited by Mayan descent people. You can see that the gathering portion of it itself at this meeting was um, designed for us to take information, collect data, and see if in fact these projects were being successful or not, and how many people were involved with each of these projects. The next picture shows um, the team. Gentleman that's second from the um, right, uh, his name is Oscar, he's a Rotarian. And the uh, lady in the middle with the blue shirt, her name is Veronica. She is the president of the Rotary Club of um, Chiquimula de la Sierra. And uh, that is the active club in the area that is responsible for getting, getting these projects done, evaluating and making sure that there's communication back and forth between the beneficiaries, those people that are working within the project, and also the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations. In this case, it was Project Harvest uh, that was cooperating uh, organization, helping out with this project itself. And as you can see in the picture also, um, the, the people there definitely are, were shorter in stature, and you could also tell that they were of Mayan descent. The uh, clothing that they wear is beautiful. They do a great job of putting uh, their clothing and color together. I've never been in an area where the clothes were so bright and vivid. Uh, and, and the people themselves, very kind, very hospitable people. And they were all very gracious and cordial and uh, grateful for what we have done so far for Rotary in that area. The next picture I show is a picture of one of the second project sites. This is a Tunuco, Tunuco Abajo. Uh, that project site, again, was up in the mountains. It's a very extreme mountainous area. If you look at the cutaways from the land and the soil, it's almost all rock, rock and stone. The actual soil itself that's on these mountainsides is about six to eight inches in depth. So the rest of it is all in rock. And the project has to do with how to develop and build terracing on this land to try and create farms. The first meeting that we had was in this building that you see. This is a small um, school area that actually had been abandoned. So we had to go through um, wires to sit inside this, this area. It originally started out as a community center. Unfortunately, that community center failed to um, be successful, was abandoned, and now it just becomes a gathering area itself. And so this is the families and, and the areas that we met. The next picture shows um, right before the meeting some of the people that came to visit with us and talk to us about this meeting itself. The next picture shows, uh, again, uh, the group of people, um, mostly women of Mayan descent. And you can see, again, uh, the vivid clothing that they have. It, it's really beautiful and how the women were out in full force. And when I say that, this project's very unique. And unique in that oftentimes rotary projects or humanitarian projects focus on an entire community. Well, with the garden community project, we found that it was best 
to have it implemented by the women of the villages. So each of these project sites actually were mostly developed and built by women themselves. And these women that you see in this picture were each members of the household family, and they were the ones in charge of and responsible for the garden. What makes it also unique is that these women now could raise their children in a home environment, never have to leave the house, yet still make enough money to go ahead and make money for their family and also have enough food there on site. And so their job obligation actually becomes home-based. And one of the successes to this project was the fact that they actually could work out of their houses. And this also benefited the children because children could go to school and then come back after that and have somebody at home for them, waiting for them, and to take care of them. Each of the garden sites had this plaque uh, displayed on it. Uh, the, the people that had these gardens were very proud to display those. Most of the time, it was either right in the center of the garden or right at the gateway to the garden itself. These uh, posts that you see and the little bit of wire that you could detect on the side was actually done to protect these gardens. Each garden is surrounded, they're 100 square feet, each garden is surrounded by a six foot fence that keeps the animal and livestock out of these garden areas and so there's no destruction by, um, by wildlife or by the animals. The crops that were selected were all based on needs and nutritional value of it. So the crops specific were selected by the non-governmental organization, in this case, Project Harvest. Uh, they furnish the seeds, the fertilizers, the soil amendments, the tools, the mentoring, and also the know-how on how to build these, um, these terraces for the, the growth of these crops. Because as you could see in the other pictures, it's a very steep and severe area of, of uh, Guatemala. The extra crops that they grow are then harvested and used for trade or bartering or for money. So um, any of the income in this very low income area, um, the excess growth um, projects that they have, the produce is then sold. The project itself is a three year plan. The first year, and this was the first year complete, had to do with creating and building the terraced areas. The second part has to do with then growing the crop itself Phase three will include doing water catchment, rain catchment, because this is a very arid area, and also creating a market for the um, people to actually sell what they have in excess. The pictures that you will see next is uh, one of the uh, ladies of the village. She had, this is her garden. She, as you can see, very proud of what they've done. This is something brand new that they had never done before. So you can see the pride in this lady's face, something that she had not done and for her to be able to fend for, create, and have food for family to put on the table is something very unique. The next picture shows uh, another house. Again, this one here was on a very terraced area. Very steep, very severe. That terrace she's standing on is probably about four or five feet high. And this lady that you see in the picture was actually responsible for building the terraces herself too. So she had to break down that mountainside and stack the stone backfill it with soil to create this pocket that she's actually growing her produce on right now. The next picture is, again, one of the successes. This is a gentleman that was very proud. He was one of the leaders in that community, showing how, in fact, to do it the right way. He shows a picture there. The people standing in the background are Rotarians, and they are the ones that have uh, helped mentor through the process itself. And you can see the, the produce that they develop, there's quite a bit of food there for, for a, a given family. What's unique about this project is that this garden was done last year. This is the first year in production. The fertilizers, things like that that they use, were all um, organic, biodegradable, so we didn't have problems with water contamination or anything like that. But remember that in this area, rain occurs during the tropical season. So it's a tropical band type of rain. It occurs from anywhere from May into October, possibly into November. And that is the rain season. These products and what you see in the first, these last few pictures have all been pictures of that area during the rainy season. So the success of this product actually had to do with the rain itself. And you can see how desolate, how dry that is. When I visited there, it was right before the next rainy season came. So they have gone about five, six months without any rain. And you can see how barren these gardens are. And this is what's currently uh, what you're seeing. The proud lady that had built these terraces and, and the production that she had that has now gone to just about zero because of the fact that there's no water to uh, continue growing crops. 
And this was one of the parts that we knew was going to be a setback to the project itself. And one of the reasons why we included with that the rain catchment system. And, and as you could see, the slope is very severe. Uh, these people spent a lot of time building these terraces to create these gardens themselves. The next picture is a picture from the top looking down of that same garden. And you can see the pride and the workmanship in this. Uh, these people built these uh, terraces um, just with hand tools. There is nothing, no survey marks, nothing else other than a pick, a shovel, and uh, a, a lot of work in stacking these handwork. The levels are very level. I, we took a look at those things and it was amazing without having a level in place how they could have created these gardens with, at, at such a, a very unique and leveled area. The next picture itself uh, will show a picture of the rain catchment system. This is phase two. And uh, the picture you see in the foreground is a lined rain catchment uh, reservoir that holds up to 320 gallons, roughly, is the capacity of this, uh, this reservoir. That's going to have a roof put on it, and on the roof we'll have rain gutters placed on it with it draining into the uh, rain catchment system itself. The rain catchment will then be protected from a lot of dirt, debris, uh, wind, area, wind damage, things like that, fruit, vegetables, leaves that would fall in it because of the roof element that we put on there. And this will help control the contaminants falling into each of those uh, rain catchment um, reservoirs. The next picture you see is one that was filled up. This one uh, was not one that we saw, but one that the picture was taken from previously, the previous rain season. This is the idea that they have. This rain water would be enough for them to actually be able to continue harvesting and growing in those uh, gardens for as much as four or five more months. So that increases then their productivity range up to probably about nine to 10 months. Ideally 11 months of the year, they would actually be able to have harvested crop for themselves. Picture now is a picture of mulching. And as we know, uh, mulching is very important not only to build up soils, but also to help, um, I would say, open the soil up to where the soil would become more receptive to fertilizers, to nutrients, and also to water. The other advantage of uh, mulching is, is that it would be used as a soil moisture retention uh, barrier. In other words, you could water the, the garden put down a mulch layer of that, and that would help retain the moisture in the soil, not only because of the insulation of it, but also it reduces the temperature. So when the temperature is in the air, like 100 degrees, the moisture and the mulch itself would keep the temperature down to in, in the low 80s, maybe high 70s. So that is definitely one of the benefits of using mulch to help grow. The next picture you see is um, the creek. And when I say this is the creek, this is actually the water that this community was receiving for the seasonal area. Unfortunately, you can see it's dry. Um, this community actually has to get by without water for um, a number of months, two to possibly three months of the year. They have very little water that they have to drink with. And so that's when veg vegetables uh, and having to purchase uh, water becomes one of the necessities. The next picture you see, unfortunately, shows what that community is living with right now. This girl is in a, um, the only water hole that is actually s supplying six different families. And as you can see, she's doing the laundry right there. They, they uh, do laundry, wash their clothes, they bathe in it. And that same small water hole, about a two foot square hole that you see right next to her, is gonna be also the water that they were gonna be using to live off of for the next two months. So um, unfortunately, that is one part that I s I've seen in this area where it's going to be a difficult uh, challenge as far as the project itself in creating the success. The next picture you'll see is with the Rotarians, the ones that visited the site with me, and we are discussing how we could now include water as part of the project scope itself. Knowing that they have nutrition, that they're going to have vegetables, they're going to have fruits, they're going to have things to live off of, and that 50% uh, malnutrition rate is going to substantially be reduced. If they don't have good drinking water, if they don't have water available, it's going to be probably as detrimental as, as having nothing. And the reason for that is most of them will not be able to retain the nutrition, the foods, if they don't have water because of the waterborne diseases. I also found that uh, in evaluating this site that there were a number of uh, 
infant deaths the year previous to that, unfortunately. And that also had to do with malnutrition and from waterborne diseases. And again, one of the reasons why we as Rotarians go into these sites is to take a look at how we could change, how we could affect and bring about future, future promises for those people that have been repressed for so many years. The next picture is a picture of the uh, Chiquimula de la Sierra Club uh, meeting at a meeting site, and it's one of the advantages or bon bonuses that I get to do is meet with the Rotarians of, of each of these areas. This club itself was a smaller club, about 17 members, but very proud and doing amazing things. This project was their largest project that they had actually um, tackled uh, to date, and this $200,000 grant that will be affecting over 400 people uh, is, is a huge undertaking for a club of about 17. The funding, again, came from out of the area, came from Canada and the Minnesota area, but the project itself is being administered by these Rotarians. And so uh, hats off to those Rotarians doing those great, great things around the world. The next picture uh, is a picture of myself with uh, one of my club, club uh, members. And when I say that, I'm an honorary member of the Rotary E-Club of uh, Global Service. And last year's president, actually because it's an e-club, it meets online, the president was from Guatemala. And uh, he and his wife, uh, also in the picture, came and got me on my last four hours of this trip. I had four hours lax time, downtime, where I actually got to do something. So they came to the city of Guatemala, picked me up, and took me to the city of Antigua. And uh, I, I have to say is that one thing Rotary does do, it creates friendships worldwide. I had never met Kurt nor his wife, but uh, we were just like old friends catching up. It was like a reunion. And this is one of the things that Rotary does well and does quite well, is that you have these opportunities because every person in Rotary worldwide has the same passion of helping others. And that same passion creates uh, high character and, and good people. The picture that you see next was uh, in Antigua itself, one of the beautiful areas. I had the fortune of being there about um, five years ago, six years ago now, um, for a district conference with, again, Jose Moreno, the pr gentleman that was in the first picture. He invited me to this conference, and it was a beautiful area, and we enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, even though it looks like it's a very tranquil area, the temperature uh, there was about 84 degrees, 85 degrees, but still very comfortable. The next picture is, uh, again, the typical Antigua uh, landscape that you would see. The ruins of Antigua, a lot of history, uh, historical value there. And it's fascinating because this community, this city, the city of Antigua, was developed around these ruins. It was an old trade area brought in by, uh, probably by missionaries for the Catholic churches, but they developed this huge city. And uh, that city never went away, even though the ruins are still there. The city itself is a very thriving community. And looking at that and, see, and seeing that part of it, it's, it's kind of fascinating how tourism helps boost a lot of the economy in this area. The next picture I have is a picture of, again, an indigenous person. And she's doing and selling the, the wares that she makes during the day. Um, I put this picture in here because it seems like no matter where I go in, in the world, uh, a lot of these project sites, the developing worlds, there's often an imbalance, an imbalance of economy, an imbalance of what people have and what people don't have. Unfortunately, it, it seems to focus on those people that have been repressed. And when I say that, this project was a, a project to help benefit the Mayan Chorti people. Um, these people also are indigenous, most likely of Mayan descent. And the unfortunate part is most of them cannot read, cannot write, uh, and they fend for themselves by doing what they do and, and know, and that is by selling their wares. The next picture is a picture of uh, one of the ladies actually doing these uh, hand-woven projects. And you can see that uh, the workmanship is amazing. It, it's unbelievable. And she takes a lot of pride in it. She actually, I asked her if I could take the picture. She said, of course you could take the picture. I took the picture, making sure that it was okay with her. And she was very proud showing me how she had done this for her whole life, how her generations, how her mother had taught her, how her grandmother had taught her. And it's, it's the pride of the workmanship that was, uh, in my opinion, very impressive to me. But again, 
where, where does she go with this? That's all she does all day long, uh, as, as far as what she could do to make a life. She's one of the more successful ladies. Uh, she's done a nice job, her products are quite nice, and she sells to a lot of the tourists to come through. But the unfortunate part, again, is the tourists that come in with the money will barter and, and buy these things for, for pennies, pennies on the dollar, because of the fact that these people still need that money to live off of. And so looking at this and knowing what's happening in these areas uh, and what Rotary does, I think that's going to be our next step. We can benefit people by saving lives, as you've seen by this agricultural project. But we also need to try and create more equality, more balance for people. And those people that have been repressed for centuries are those people that we need to reach out with and make a difference with. And I think this is the start of it. Projects itself that create this kind of promise, this kind of idea, is something that we as Rotarians need to focus on. Now, I took you on this trip to Guatemala because uh, of the fact that it's, I've had the opportunity through Rotary to go ahead and evaluate a lot of these projects. Oftentimes, Rotarians and non-Rotarians will never see what Rotary actually does. You don't see the footprint. You don't see what's going on in the world. And the show, hopefully, will give you some light as to one of the few areas that a small group of people have done to change those lives. Rotary itself, uh, whether it's in Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Mexico, all of the other places I've traveled in the world, all come up with the same thing, and that is that it's the Rotarians themselves that carry the torch, that make a difference, that see what could happen. And as you can see by the picture, um, Rotary is making a difference. It's making a difference, it's changing lives, and it's something that I personally am very proud to be a part of. And as more Rotarians get involved, as we start putting the money out there, because there's millions, billions of dollars that go out through Rotary each year for these projects that we would see and be able to help all those other people around the world. With that, take a look at Rotary, not only what it's doing in the community, but what it's doing worldwide. Be very proud of the efforts that all of these 1.2 million Rotarians are doing in changing what's going on in this world. And with that, thank you very much. We hope to see you next time.